wigs in office. So this leads us up to the election of 1840. Keep in mind, um, Martin Van Buren won the presidential election of 1836. So he was the president. He has only been president for one term, so he's going up for re-election. The problem is um, his administration really didn't have any kind of program that could really combat this charge of helplessness in the face of economic adversity during his time in office. And so the Whigs come in saying that they can fix it. Um, the Whigs, though, have to decide who they are going to run against Martin Van Buren in 1840. And so I'm actually going to have you vote here in just a second to decide who you think the Whigs should put forward as their candidate. The first option is Henry Clay, literally like one of the founders of the Whig Party. And we've seen him multiple times already leading up to this. Now, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? You have to keep that in mind. Um, he really did seem like the most likely candidate because he really represented the party's ideological heart. Now, the other option was to put forward William Henry Harrison. Hopefully his name sounds vaguely familiar as well to you. The thing is, he um, was from Ohio and he had run well in like regional elections. Um, he had revealed like a common touch with voters. He also was untainted with any kind of association with, you know, the Bank of the United States, the Masonic Order, slaveholding. And of course, he's a military hero from the War of 1812. So, you know, they can make him out to be the patriotic soldier worthy of the people's trust. So who do you think they should put forward? And explain your reasoning why. Make sure you're voting. That is part of your uh, journal today. Well, if you said William Henry Harrison, you were correct. Basically, uh, they placed victory above principle in this case. And so um, then they would go on to uh, basically geographically balance their ticket by selecting John Tyler, a planter from Virginia, who had actually been a former Democrat who had broken with Jackson as um, William Henry Harrison's running mate. Now, in the actual election of 1840, Democrats actually <laughs> inadvertently gave the Whig campaign a tremendous boost. The thing is, William Henry Harrison was 67, so he was pretty old. And so basically, the Democrats would wisecrack that he's old Granny Harrison, and that, oh, he's, you know, a simpleton, and he'd like nothing more than to retire to a log cabin with a government pension and a barrel of hard cider. But the Whigs use this to basically create a William Henry Harrison that never existed. They're like, yeah, you're right. He's a common man. He's a yeoman farmer, humble origins, homespun tastes. And in fact, it could be kind of like a rags to riches story, but more looking at politics that, you know, his rise to prominence is the democratic ideal and a model of success that, you know, other Americans could follow in the future. Plus, of course, it's always great to have your slogans like, rather than calling him Martin Van Buren, we'll call him Martin Van Ruin. Yeah, there we go. Worked in junior high, can work now. So, um, <laughs> the Whigs basically are going to beat the Democrats at their own game come this election. They use all kinds of campaign strategies, including like slogans, parades, pageantry, um, carnivals, huge rallies where they could woo voters with food, drink, and music. They would gain both the presidency and control of Congress in 1840. And the thing is, William Henry Harrison won 53% of the popular vote. And not only that, voter turnout had surged to be 78% of eligible voters. So, William Henry Harrison was exactly the kind of president the Whigs wanted in power. He pledged to, you know, follow the dictates of party leaders in Congress. He wanted, he was supposed to defer to the judgment of his cabinet. 
Um, he'd even agree to like call Congress into special sessions just to act on like Whig party measures. And a month into office, he dies. Yeah, his death was a huge blow to the Whig party because they were really hoping to establish their credibility with having their not, you know, president that was a Whig president. So John Tyler, the vice president, is going to be the first vice president ever to succeed on the death of a president. He was not William Henry Harrison. He was a stiff and unbending planter um, from Virginia. He very much subscribed to the idea of states rights and an agrarian philosophy that really puts him at odds with the you know urban and commercial elements of the Whig party. He saw Clay's whole economic nationalism as a program just for rank corruption and he felt like it was surrendering the constitutional rights of the south to you know power hungry politicians of the north as well as manufacturers of the north now clay despite the fact that john tyler is now the president he's going to go ahead and try to push through his party's agenda um he wanted to repeal the independent treasury system he wanted to replace um, it by establishing a new national bank. He wanted uh, protective tariffs. He wanted the distribution of proceeds from like government public land sales to um, help fund like internal improvements. Tyler does not allow this to happen though. He would use his power against this. Uh, twice he actually vetoed bills that would have reestablished um, a bank of the United States. And in fact, the second time he vetoed it, this led to the resignation of the cabinet that he had inherited from William Henry Harrison. The Whigs basically expel Tyler from their party. Clay tried to salvage what was left of his whole like American system, but in the end, he doesn't get his national bank. He has no funds for internal improvements and he gets only a slightly higher tariff. Which brings us to Texas. Now there's a lot about Texas I don't go into here. I definitely would recommend you reading in your book and everything about it. But um, basically, Tyler is the president at this time, but he is very aware that he has been expelled from the Whig party. And so he, <laughs> he wants to be reelected as the president, but as the Democratic nominee, <laughs> at least for a 1844. And his goal to get this nomination was basically by annexing Texas. Now, Texas had been a slave holding republic since 1836, when basically rebellious Americans who had initially been invited into Mexico kind of to make a border state against Chiman uh, Comanche raids and everything, um, had then gone on to declare their independence from Mexico, partly because uh, Mexico tried to outlaw slavery and the Americans that moved in wanted to keep the people they had enslaved. Yeah. Anyway, um, they declared their independence from Mexico and Jackson had refused the new nation's request to be annexed into the United States. He had basically extended like diplomatic recognition of them as a nation, but he didn't want to annex them because he was worried it might provoke war with Mexico. And he was really concerned about that we've seen slavery starting to crop up more and more often as an issue. And he was concerned that this might um, inflame sectional tensions by bringing in a new slave state. Privately though, he does urge Texans to you know, keep trying. So he basically sidesteps the Texas issue and Tyler renews this issue in 1843, trying to curry favor with the Democrats and he'd secretly open negotiations with Texans. There's a lot of drama here. It's done in secret and treaties, but they don't annex Texas quite yet. And this brings us to the actual election of 1844. The thing is, um, at this point, the Whigs are going with their ideological heart. They're going for Clay. He is a lock for the Whigs as their nomination. So if you've been trying to vote for Clay this whole time, now you've got your man. Um, whereas 
the Democrats weren't really sure who they were going to put forward. At first, it looks like they were going to do Martin Van Buren, but then Martin Van Buren came out that he was anti-Texas, and this basically costed him the um, party's nomination. So you get a deadlocked convention eventually turning to James K. Polk of Tennessee. Now, he was very much a confirmed expansionist, and he also had the blessing of Jackson to be the party's nomination. He basically ran on a platform specifically linking Oregon to Texas as territorial objectives. Now, this is a big deal because on one hand, Texas could have been problematic to some Northerners who might have been anti-slavery, but a lot of New England merchants also really wanted Oregon because they saw it as a great jumping off point for expanding trade out with China and just Asia in general. And so this expansionist program really unites the Democrats and they have a lot more enthusiasm coming into the election of 1844 than they did back in 1840. Um, just, you know, the motivation of cheap, abundant land, um, some anti-British sentiments, because remember at this point there was shared custody of Oregon, so trying to end that. Whereas comparatively, the Whig campaign is really out of focus. The thing is, um, Clay recognized that his anti-Texas stance hurt him in the South, and so he kind of began to waver on this issue. But actually, that waver ends up cutting into his support amongst the anti-slavery Whigs in the North. Uh, you can see here, Clay lost by less than 2% of the popular vote, although he lost by quite a bit more electoral college, so it's questionable if he you know, could have won that much of a big gap. Um, but Clay lost. Clay never becomes a president of the United States. Uh, jumping back to Tyler, though, um, the thing is, even though James K. Polk has been voted in to be the next president, Tyler is still in office for a few more months. And so at this point, he is going to resort to a constitutionally unprecedented, expedient joint resolution in Congress that would formally invite Texas to join the Union. Um, he is going to sign this in 1845, and in this way, he's secured Texas and basically gotten his so-called revenge on the Whigs. Um, really, Texas, more than any other issue, defeated Clay and the Whigs in 1844. I should also point out, though, um, if you're looking at Texas and when it came into the Union, Tyler secures Texas, but not all of the, you know, I's are dotted and the T's are crossed until James K. Polk is in office. So James K. Polk really finalizes Texas coming into the nation. So I want you to think about this. This isn't part of your journal or anything. Um, it was part of your journal earlier when we talked about who were you going to vote for, um, Henry Clay or William Henry Harrison. But what is the importance of the Whigs? What is important about, like, their time in the presidency? Just think about that and think about like what lessons can be learned from them, what can be taken from them, how do they affect you today? Thinking about like third parties and everything or the formation of parties at all.